Welcome to this lecture on dynamic stock models, which is part of the third method section of the Industrial Ecology Open Online course. In this lecture, we will learn about the population balance model, the leaching model, impulse response functions, age cohorts, and finally, we will work our way towards the lifetime model, which is a central part of dynamic MFA. Population balance model is a process with a stock an inflow and an outflow, which are connected by the mass balance. So whenever you have individuals flowing into the stock, they reside there for a while during their lifetime or their residence time, and at the end of their lifetime in the stock, they leave. So this can be, of course, society as a whole, where people get born, so that's the birth rate, and they die, the death rate, and in the meantime, we have the population of people in a certain area or on the planet. And this model can be applied in any other cases where some kind of balance equation holds. For example, in the case of the residence time of molecules in a chemical reactor. We have the mass balance equation written here. The change of stock over time is the difference between inflows and outflows. And the stock is then the integral from the starting time to the present time over the stock change rate. A related but different model is the leaching model. In a leaching model, if we have a stock given, we can compute the outflow by the simple relationship, where we say the outflow is proportional to the stock. The outflow is, so to say, slowly leaching from the stock. In case where there is no inflow, so we just have the stock that is slowly leaching, the outflow will be identical to the stock change. And then we have a situation where the stock change is proportional to the stock. This leads us back to the differential equation we had as an example in the last lecture, where we learned that the solution to this equation is the exponential decline. And the typical application of such exponential decline is the radioactive decay, or as we had earlier, the leaching from deposits of pollutants or nutrients from landfills, from tailings, and from the soil. The advantage of the leaching model is that it's easy to apply and it doesn't require you to know anything about the composition of the stock here. Like, for example, how old the different products are. You can just treat them as one homogeneous mass or amount of products. And that also means that the leaching model only works for processes that don't have any internal memory or where, in other words, the probability of an item leaving the stock is independent of its residence time. Another important concept to understand the stock dynamics is the so-called impulse response function. Let's take the same system as we have before and assume that we put an inflow into this stock here that is just a singularity. So at one point in time, we put a certain amount of stuff into the stock and then we sit and wait at the outflow and see what comes out here. And this type of study is called the measurement of the impulse response function. So I measure how my system here responds, in this case responds with an outflow, to an instantaneous inflow of matter. There's of course different types of impulse responses depending on the internal mechanism of your system. Typical behavior is an oscillating behavior. That would be, for example, a swing that you can push once and then the swing will oscillate and damp over time so that it reaches the old state again. Another typical response is a delayed response where we trigger the system at time zero and then after a certain delay we have a response of the system. And in our case, this would, of course, be a lifetime model. We put a product into the stock, and then after a certain time, it comes out again, spread over different years. Or we have a decaying response, for example, in the case of the leaching model, where we put a certain amount of matter into the stock, and then it slowly declines over time. What we can do now is to take different input pulses over time and see how their response overlaps. And if the response of the stock is linear, we can just add 
the responses to the different input peaks at the different times. So when my first input peak here creates a certain outflow after some time and the second one creates another outflow, I can just add them all together and then I get the total outflow as a response to the different inflows and the total outflow is the sum of the outflows of the individual input peaks. Analogy would here be the sound of an orchestra which is the superposition or just the sum of the sounds made by the different musical instruments. And a counter example would be if you have a guitar amplifier with a sound effect generator after on. These are typical nonlinear and the distortions created cannot just be seen as the sum of the different distortions of the input signal, but there is a nonlinear response built in. And when I can trace the different input peaks separately throughout the stocks and also in the outflow, so I can look at an outflow and can say, okay, this part of the outflow is associated with this input peak and this other part is associated with another input peak, then I can trace the different input fractions and I can talk of the input fractions as so-called H chords. So I can say, each input that was inserted at a certain time represents the H cohort of that time. So if I consume a vehicle in the year 2015, then I can say that this vehicle is part of the 2015 H cohort. And I can trace this 2015 vehicle throughout its lifetime. And when it comes out again, I can then say, hey, this is not just a random vehicle that leaves the stock, but it's actually a vehicle that belongs to the H cohort of 2015. The tracing of H cohorts is very central in dynamic stock modeling because it allows us to, for example, trace the changing material composition over time. Like cars from earlier years would maybe contain more steel than cars that are manufactured today. So this is quite important information for the waste management industry. When I can trace age cohorts throughout the lifetimes, I can also define the average lifetime of an age cohort. How do I do that? It's best visualized with the plot here. So let's say we have at time zero an initial stock, so we have a certain amount of vehicles registered, and then over time that stock is slowly decaying because the vehicles either crash in an accident or most of them are just taken out of use and sent to the scrapyards. So I have a curve that declines over time, the initial cohort decays over time, and what I can do here, I can read this graph from two directions. The default direction is read from the x-axis. So I can stand here and can say, at any given time, this curve tells me how much of the stock is still there. It tells me that at 5t so much is left, at 2t so much is left, and so on. But what I can also do is, I can read this graph from the y-axis side. I can stand here and can say, okay, I have a certain fraction of the stock and this curve tells me how long this stock lasts until here and then it leaves the stock. So from the horizontal perspective, I can say this curve is an ordered account of the different residence times of the items. I have items with very short residence time that live here and I have items down here with very long residence times. And from this perspective, I can also define the average residence time of the material in the stock. The average residence time is obtained if I take the entire stock here, so all the y-axis, all the y-axis range, and assume that this material lives for an average amount of time until t-bar, and then it all decays at the same time. And this average lifetime must be the same as all the individual lifetimes set, added up and then divided by the overall stock. And this again is the same as the area under this curve, which I can just calculate by computing the integral here. So with this triple argument, first taking the average lifetime as the average residence time of the entire stock, so S0 times t bar, 
then saying that this one must equal all the individual lifetimes summed up and divided by the stock and then taking the vertical perspective we're saying that this area under the curve equals the integral over the stock over time i arrive at this different defining equations for the average lifetime where i say if i integrate the stock over time normalize it for s0 i get the average lifetime it's a bit complicated to explain, but it's a very powerful concept that is visualized here. Another important building block of dynamic stock modeling is the difference between fixed and distributed lifetimes. A fixed lifetime means that I have a input pulse at a certain time, and after a certain time, the whole input pulse comes out again. A typical example are products for which we have a safety regulations like smoke detectors, for example. Smoke detectors have to be taken out of use, in many cases after a certain time, or fire extinguishers. So we would say we equip a building with these fire extinguishers and maybe after 10 years they all are taken out of use and a new generation is phased in. For many products, however, the situation is not as easy. If you think of buildings, for example, we know that the buildings built in a different certain year are phased out at different years. For example, the 1960 buildings, those that were erected in 1916s, will gradually be taken out of use. Some are demolished earlier than others, and some are still standing after a very long time. In such a situation, where the products or the material from a certain age cord leaves at different times, then requires us to model a distributed lifetime. And to do that, we will apply the concept of probability distributions that was already introduced in the method section 2 about error propagation. So here is a discrete case where we can just record the probability of an item leaving the stock at a certain time t. The unit of the probability here is 1 and the sum is also 1, meaning that the probability that the item leaves the stock at some point equals to 1 and this, of course, comprises leaving after short times, medium time, and after very long time. In cases where the time is continuous, we cannot use a discrete probability distribution. Instead, we need to use the concept of probability density functions. And the reason is that if you, for example, take the time one year, that the duration of this one year anniversary is zero. Only intervals have a non-zero durations, so what I can do is I can say the probability of the item leaving the stock between, let's say, one year and maybe 1.5 year is the area under this curve. And that means that for a single time there is no area and hence there is no probability. But there is, of course, a certain rate here and this rate is called the probability density. As in the discrete case, we have a normalizing conditions for probability density, which is that the area under this curve must be 1, and that means that the total probability of the item leaving the stock eventually is 100%. Because we have a time dimension here, to make the integral dimensionless, the unit of the probability density function must be 1 over time. We can now compute the output from a pulse input, both for the discrete case and the continuous case. And this we call the lifetime model for an input pulse. So in the discrete case, we are given an input pulse at a rate in kilotons per year. So we would say that at time zero, we have maybe 10 kilotons coming in. And with a discrete time period of one year, we then have an average inflow rate for the pulse of 10 kilotons per year. And then multiplying this initial input rate by the probability density of the stock leaving at time t, we get the outflow. So we take the inflow, multiply with the probability of leaving t minus t0 years later, which gives us the outflow. In the continuous case, we do exactly the same, only here we have a unit conflict. So here we would not 
measure the inflow in kilotons per year, but instead we would measure the total input amount just in kilotons and get the per year dimension from the PDF. So by multiplying the total inflow amount by the PDF at a certain time t, we get the outflow of the time t, the rate or at this particular time. Here we have an illustration. So when we take the input pulls at a certain time, the input goes into stock where it is stored for a time and then slowly released. So in the case of a distributed and delayed output flow, here we have a normal distribution for the lifetime. We can see that the outflow starts growing after a certain time, reaches a maximum and then slowly declines. And from the mass balance, I can compute the stock that was zero initially, then jumps to the full value of input of the input flow and then slowly declines. And you can see here that the derivative of this decline here is proportional to this outflow height here. If we now have not a single input pulse, but a time series, we are back to our old age cohort consideration. So what I do is, if the stock responds linearly and all the stocks that we usually treat in dynamic MFA do that, I can just take the output pulses from the discrete inflows and sum them all up. So I take each individual inflow measured in kilotons per year, multiply with the respective probability of leaving at time t and sum up over all the different inflow times which are here labeled as tau. In the continuous case I do something similar but here I have to deal with continuous arrivals and then I cannot use the sum but I need to use an integral. So if I take my inflow time series weigh it with the probability density function of leaving and integrate over all the time where the inflow has happened, I get the outflow at the time t. And this last operation, inflow at integration time times the PDF of leaving at a certain age, t minus tau, integrated over the whole inflow interval, is called the convolution. That is a specific mathematical operation which is applied in this case. You can think of it as a filter, that we take the inflow function t and filter it with the probability of leaving the stock and the result of this convolution operation, this mathematical operation, is the outflow. We will apply the convolution in our next lecture on inflow-driven and stock-driven modeling, but for now we are done with the material.